Welcome to the Data Science Institute's virtual seminar series. My name is Dr. Sarah Mackey from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Here at Lawrence Livermore, data science has become an essential discipline in many of our key program areas. LLNL is home to many challenging data sets, as well as home to some of the world's most advanced supercomputers. Our data science staff work in a variety of areas, including machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data analytics, statistical inference, predictive modeling, and uncertainty quantification. The Data Science Institute acts as a central hub for our lab's data science activities. We host events like this seminar series in order to introduce new ideas and potential collaborations to our laboratory staff. We invite speakers from outside the laboratory, from the Bay Area and beyond, to share their innovative approaches with our data science community. We are pleased now to include a wider audience in our seminar series through these recordings. You can read about past speakers at our website at data-science.llnl.gov or you can email us at datascience.llnl.gov. Thank you and enjoy the seminar series. Today we have with us Joyce Ho. Um, she is an assistant professor in the computer science department at Emory University. She received her PhD in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Texas at Austin and a master's and bachelor's in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. Uh, her research focuses on the development of novel machine learning algorithms to address problems in healthcare, such as identifying patient subgroups or phenotypes, integration of new streams of data, fusing different modalities of data, and dealing with conflicting expert annotations. Uh, her work has been supported by the National Science Foundation, including a career award, and also uh, uh, supported by the National Institutes of Health, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and also Johnson & Johnson. So thanks for joining us today, Joyce, and I'll turn the, the time over to you. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, so feel free to interrupt if there's any questions. Um, but today I'm going to talk about tensor factorization for biomedical representation learning. Uh, so prior to that, I sort of want to just standardize the vocabulary because representation learning can have different meanings. Uh, in particular, what I'm, I'm considering, right, is you can have any modality of data, whether it's tabular, uh, text, or even thinking about graph, uh, running it typically through an unsupervised machine learning model, right? Uh, and then what you're going to do is you're going to embed the data in a, in a different embedding space. Um, and so typically the reason you want to do this is your input data is sparse and high dimensional, right? Uh, and in the end, for some downstream machine learning model, what we're looking for is to turn it into a dense and low dimensional, right? Uh, and the idea is that I can learn a model more efficiently and more effectively. So what I'm gonna focus on today in the context of representation learning is thinking about two forms of biomedical data, uh, electronic health records, and also thinking about biomedical literature. Uh, training some model, right? Uh, and then what we're going to do with this model is thinking about how you can do risk prediction uh, and abstract screening. So I'm going to motivate the two aspects of those talks. Uh, but in particular, what I'm going to look to answer, right, is how to deal with missing and regular sample data, right, while thinking about higher order interactions, uh, how to capture heterogeneous interactions in a bibliography net network, and how to encode temporal information. Uh, and all of this I'm going to do in the context of Tensor. So I'm going to give a quick overview, right? And I apologize to any computational math person that's in the audience. I am going to do you a big disservice, right? Uh, and so the first thing I'm going to cover is thinking about matrix factorization. Um, and so it's a common dimensionality reduction technique. Uh, the idea is to do, come up with a low rank approximation to the original matrix. Uh, and then what I'm looking to do is to uncover some latent relations. So the most common mechanism is thinking about movies, right? Uh, if you want to embed them in low dimensional space, you can imagine that one axis is looking at serious versus escapists, uh, and the other axis is looking at gender, right? Uh, and you might embed different movies in, along those spectrums. Now, one really, really common mechanism is thinking about singular value decomposition, or SVD. So, if I think about an M by N matrix, uh, I can construct our embedding in an M by R space. R is going to be much smaller. 
Uh, and formally, let's say that I, you know, input is x, right? I'm going to look to factorize x into u, uh, sigma, and b transpose. Um, and the important things to note are u and b are orthogonal matrices. Uh, and then the nice, you know, benefit is that the singular values will then denote the importance of your latent dimension. And you can go ahead and then use u as your embedding space, right? So it's, it's a nice mechanism to get at embedding sort of quickly. And this is, you know, all pre-deep learning, right? So I should caveat as saying that the last couple of years things have changed a little, but SVD is still very much a workhorse in thinking about, you know, representation learning. Uh, and you might think, well, what if I don't want my matrices to be orthogonal? Or I want to think about learning parts of it, right? And so uh, another very common one is thinking about non-negative matrix factorization. Uh, so both W and H are non-negative. Uh, one of the really nice benefits of NMF, right, is that it actually induces sparsity, but, you know, sort of naturally. And you have this sum of parts representation. Uh, and so Lee and Sung proposed it back in 1999 uh, as thinking about learning the parts of an object. And so I wanted to just sort of contextualize it in the, con you know, thinking about embedding in the context of NMF. Uh, thinking about it from a factor weights and a latent factor definition. So let's think about this from the context of health records, right? So you might have something like patients by terms, right? And I'm looking to factorize it into this low dimensional space. And I'm going to say without loss of generality that uh, W and H sum to one, right? So what I might do when I actually factorize this, right, if I look at the latent factor weights, right, uh, is I can identify subgroups. And so this might be something like mild hypertension group, right? So, you know, and I can look at, you know, what are the weights along a particular column, right? So remember, H is, is you know, sort of transposed. So uh, I'm, I'm going to think about it from, from a column perspective. Uh, and then I could say hypertension is the most important, then beta blockers, which is a drug used to treat hypertension, is, is second. And then whether or not there are smokers might be third. And then the nice thing, right, because remember I was thinking about embeddings, right, is I might have someone like Mary Smith, and I can now embed her in this new group space. Uh, and so let's say that I can give meanings to all my different groups. Uh, so her new embedding might be that she's mostly mild hypertension, but she also has some factor of uncontrolled diabetes, and she also happens to have sleep apnea. Not very healthy, right? Uh, but that's sort of the nice representation, right? So rather than thinking about, you know, Mary Smith in the context of this really high dimensional space, I can now think of her in the context of subgroups. Now, then the question might be, well, if I'm going to assume matrix, right, uh, I'm going to assume that every column is independent of one another, right? Uh, and what I'm going to lose is when I try to sort of matricize anything is any higher order dimension uh, interactions I'm going to go ahead and undo, right? So you could imagine that, you know, oftentimes for many diseases, uh, there's prescribed medications and there's some like hierarchical structure that I'm sort of not going to capture in the context of factorizing it. So that's really the question that we're looking to do, right? Um, and tensors are a great way to think about these higher order dimensions, right? So there are generalizations of matrices to multi-dimensional array. Uh, you can actually naturally capture any N array interaction and it's actually used in many, many different domains. So I'm going to give you a few examples of this. So you probably see it very often, right? So the first one is the matrix version of it, right, which is black and white. Uh, and then the right side is going to be the tensor version, which you now encode the third, third dimension as red, green, and blue. Yeah, so that's your tensor. Uh, you can imagine that if I'm looking at sensors over time, if I wanted to think about it in three dimension, I might think about space and time together, right? Uh, and so space, right, latitude and longitude are natural axes, and then tem temporal is a third. And then probably the one that you're more familiar with, right, is thinking about recommendation systems. So let's say that I have users and movies. Uh, but what I might be interested in is the context in which they do it, right? So whether I rent a movie, pause it halfway through, right, or give it a, 
you know, thumbs down, right? Those would all be the third dimensions. So then the natural extension, right? So once I have this new representation, is to think about, you know, how I translate SVD and NMF to tensor world. Right? Uh, and so that's where tensor factorization comes in. Tensor factorization is also known as tensor decomposition as well. And there's many different versions. So I think today's talk, I'm probably gonna cover five of them. Uh, but the idea is how you can actually capture this multi-way interaction across uh, the different dimensions, sort of succinctly. So the first one I'm gonna talk about uh, is the candy comp parafat decomposition, so that's CP. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and take my tensor, right? So X is now my new tensor. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna decompose it into a sum of rank one factors. Um, and so visually it looks like this. Uh, and I'm gonna put this big disclaimer, right? I sort of mentioned this at the beginning, but my notation may not be very consistent or exact, right? So if you're a computational math person, uh, please don't hold it against me. I I'm coming at it from more from a you know, computer science perspective. Uh, but what you can think of in, in CP, right, is that it's really the sum of rank one tensors, right? Uh, and what the O is denoting is the outer product. Um, and so the, the version of this to think about, right, is if I'm thinking about NMF, right, I'm simply just going to generalize it. So in NMF space, right, I'm doing the outer product of two vectors, right? I'm just extending it to the third dimension. And lambda will just denote the weights. Um, and for simplicity, I'm just going to denote it using shorthand notation uh, in this manner. Uh, but essentially what I can get is, you know, N factor matrices as well under CP decomposition. So what we're going to use it for to begin with is thinking about how to find these patient subgroups from EHRs. Uh, and in particular, you know, let's say that I have a lot of different data, right? So what you see on this side is, you know, sort of tabular data. Uh, you can think about genetics, environment, nutrition, medication, medical history and stress and other versions. Uh, what I'm looking to do is how can I take all these different forms of data and actually identify novel disease subgroups uh, with minimal expert annotations, how I can leverage interactions amongst data sources in high dimensional EHRs, and also thinking about how to summarize these medical concepts succinctly using all EHRs. And I'll note that the, you, know, you can think about using this for different data sources as well. I'm just contextualizing it in the, in the healthcare domain. So what you can do is let's say that I construct this tensor using the patient uh, and I'm gonna look at medications and also diseases. If I use CP decomposition, uh, what I can then naturally get are these subgroups, and I'm going to call them phenotypes because uh, typically in nature, uh, or not in nature, but in medicine, computational phenotypes is, is ways that I'm looking at subgroups. And what I can get, right, is which patients belong to that subgroup. I can also get at which diseases belong to the subgroup and which medications or procedures also belong to that. And there's this really nice interpretation as well, right, downstream. Uh, because there's some sparsity, I can also get rank order of the importance of them. And because we're also still thinking about representation, right, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and assume that the patient is the first axis, and I can in fact get the patient embedding now in this lower R-dimensional space, and it's gonna be nice and dense. And you can think of patient embedding as sort of a subgroup membership as well, or phenotype membership. So I want to first convince you that this makes sense, right? So uh, we're going to run it on EHR data from Geisinger Health System. Uh, what you see in the top right corner is, is sort of the experimental settings we did. 32,000 patients, 169 different diagnoses, and 471 medications. Uh, it's extremely sparse, right? So less than 1% non-zero entries. And the outcome of interest, so the downstream prediction model that I'm looking at is heart failure prediction. So what you see here is if you did the matrix version of this data, uh, you'll notice that if I looked at one of the subgroups, this is what it would look like. Now, if I look at the tensor version of this, 
uh, this is what it would look like, right? And what you can notice, hopefully, is that the group definitions are much more concise and much more interpretable. And in fact, we quantified this with clinical experts, uh, and they found that they were oftentimes a map to medical concept. But that's probably not what you care about, right? Uh, you're probably thinking about, well, how well does it do if I wanted to use it as a representation? Uh, so what I'm showing you is the AUC area under the receiver operating characteristic curve, uh, looking at heart failure prediction. On the x-axis, right, is the number of phenotypes, the, basically the rank of my CPT composition. And what you'll notice is there's a baseline, right? So that's if I use the raw features as themselves. Uh, what I can show is that around 20, anything above 20 dimension embedding actually gives me much better performance than the original raw features using the same supervised machine learning model, which is a logistic regression. So that's pretty powerful, right? I basically took this 640 dimensional space and I compressed it to 20 and I can still have the same representation power. Now, it turns out that there's actually limitations in thinking about this, right? So one of the natural ways that I might want to take advantage of tensors is to think about time. Uh, now, if I actually look at electronic health records, right, hopefully none of you have been to the hospital recently or the doctor, right? Uh, but what you'll notice, right, is that typically uh, tensors assume regular observations and that I can align everybody in time, right? So that means your neighbor next to you it's the same timeline as me, right? And for the interns in the audience, I'm, I think I'm much older than you, right? Uh, and so clearly we should not be aligned on the same timeline, right? Or, you know, maybe we should, who knows, right? So let's think about uh, some examples of this. So let's take one, you know, one patient has sleep apnea, let's say, you know, and then comes back for the flu and then has pneumonia. There's another one who moves to Atlanta, right, midway through, and so I only see one record of them having the flu during flu season. And then let's say that there is an older gentleman uh, that, you know, is chronically sick, right, uh, has hypertension, gets some medications, gets more medications, and then has to pee. Now, you can see the timeline doesn't make sense, right, uh, unless I want to find some way to determine how often they're coming in and define some interval. Uh, and you can also notice, like, you know, using the dates may not also make sense as well. So, in fact, what we're going to call this is an irregular tensor, right? Which means that I'm no longer aligning in all dimensions anymore. So, at, for this first person, I'll have three different visits. For the second one, I'll have one. And then for the third one, I'll have four different ones. And there's no easy way for me to think about time, necessarily. But what I can think about doing is stacking them all together, all these irregular matrices. What that means is I still have the same number of columns, right? Uh, but what I'm going to think about is I want to think about varying the size along the temporal dimension, right? So one of them will have three visits, one will have one, one will have four. And some really sick patients might have like 270 or something like that. Now then, if I was to think about this irregular tensor, I also want to think about how I factorize this, right? Uh, and what I can think to do is use parafact two decomposition. So I'm going to model each matrix as x of k. And what I'm simply going to ask, right, is that they share the same uh, features b of t. You can think of this very similar to collective matrix factorization for those of you that you know, like operating in matrix factorization in space. Uh, but there are some nice components of this, which is thinking about you know, orthogonality and uniqueness that you wouldn't necessarily get in matrix factorization world. So in other words, this is a relaxation of CP to really only share one mode, that's V. Uh, and this uniqueness constraint is there to make things, uh, you know, more unique, basically, right? So uh, I don't have to worry about having different values or, you know, scale invariance or, or temporal invariance. So there's nice computational 
benefits of thinking about this particular version of Terrafact 2. So let's think about using it in the context of subgrouping again, right? Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and use the same, you know, that pair effect too. Now along the first dimension, right? Uh, what I what that means is I actually have subgroup membership a long time, um, and along this lower dimension. And so what we're going to ask, right, is that you can imagine, you know. From a health perspective, I'm not going to get sick immediately, most likely, right? Except for the acute stuff. Uh, usually, if I'm thinking about chronic and illness, it actually happens progressively over time. And so, what I want to do is I want to think about smoothing over time, but also accounting for how long I, you know, I see between measurements, right? So, in other words, if if you know I go from here to this next point, right? So that's about a thousand days later. I probably don't want smoothness constraints there. Right, because it's been some time since I've seen them. But if they're close together, I might ask that they're smooth. And so the way that we do that is we think about modeling time as a linear combination of several smooth non-negative splines. Uh, and then the goal is to learn the weights of the splines. So WK is what we're going to learn, MK is what we're going to feed into it already. Uh, what SFK will do, so if you think back to SVD, right, it will look very similar to the singular values, thinking about static weights for each subgroup. And then VFT will have that same, you know, factor weight definition that we had before. Uh, and because I care about interpretability, right, uh, I'm going to impose non-zero elements on this. And so the way we're going to do that is using that particular formulation. So I'm not gonna you know, discuss exactly how we solve this, right, or the exact weights. My hope is just to convince you and give some intuition as to how we might think about the problem. Uh, all the details of convergence and, and algorithmic analysis is all usually in the paper, which is cited below. So I'm gonna think about this now from using Children's Healthcare of Atlanta EHR data. So you'll notice that we actually have 2,400, uh, 248,000 patients, uh, 1,388 features. And actually, some of the patients are extremely sick. So we'll see them about 857 times. And if I look at this, it's fairly sparse still, about 11 million non-zero entries. So what I'm showing you here on the right are two different phenotypes or subgroups. So one is sickle cell anemia. Uh, the other one is leukemia. This is just a prototypical pair effect to decomposition that just scales very well to high dimension, like, you know, very high sp feature space, right? So that's called Spartan 2. Uh, and then what I'm going to show you, uh, so Helwick et al. proposed uh, a mechanism to think about the splines, um, but the, it doesn't account for Differences. So what you'll notice between for this particular patient, right, is that between zero and 500, because I'm imposing smoothness, uh, they'll look very similar, but it might not make a lot of sense, right? I really want the flexibility for things to go where they want. And then our version of the model is called COPA. And so what you'll see is for these same subgroups, you'll notice this big jump in terms of, you know, looking at their temporal evolution. So we're really allowing the data to go where it was, but if they're close together, right, we can smooth and make it a little bit better. So from an interpretation, it's much easier. All right, so really the time-aware smoothness can improve interpretability and meaningfulness. Now, interpretability might not mean everything. Uh, so I want to convince you that it is, in fact, at sometimes better than a deep learning model, right? So I'm, we're, what I'm showing our results for this version where we layer in static information. So static information means things that are not changing over time. So you can imagine uh, whether or not you're a smoker, uh, what insurance group you're at, your gender, right, your age, it's not gonna change much over time. Uh, and the one that you probably care most about, right, is RNN baseline, so a recurrent neural network using 345 features, uh, and we're looking at heart failure prediction. So I, I'm sort of swapping, swapping data sets on the back end behind. 
uh, and then some different baselines. And what probably matters the most, right, is our version is called PACE, right? So PACE with a logistic regression, right? At 60 dimensions actually outperforms an RNN baseline with 345 features, right? So with this lower dimensional, uh, 60 dimensional space, we actually get better heart failure prediction, right? It's more interpretable. We get this nice, uh, you know, temporal evolution that we can look at, still outperforming deep learning, right? Uh, which I think is amazing. Right, and almost nobody will believe this, right? Because everybody thinks, you know, with ChatGPT and OpenAI and and GPT-4, this is, you know, it, it's the best, right? But there are situations where thinking about matrices and tensors actually will help you quite a bit, and I think it's in when you don't have that much data. So this assumes that I see everything. Now, in practice, that will never be the case, right? There's human error to be had. Uh, people jump between different sites. And so what I'm showing you in red is errors, and what I'm showing in orange, I think, is, is messiness. So what that really means, right, is that visit three was probably coded incorrectly. Uh, and, you know, visit two was really missing, and visit, uh, Sorry, visit two was incorrectly diagnosed and visit four was missing. So what we next proposed is what's called repair, so robust parafact two. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna decompose this irregular tensor into two different parts. So let's say I have missing and erroneous entries. I'm gonna de decompose it into a clean tensor and the clean tensor will take the same form as before. Uh, and what I'm going to impose on the clean tensor is low, uh, low rank regularization, right? Uh, which is the nuclear norm. And then I'm going to decompose it also into an erroneous tensor. Uh, so I'm going to do the low rank re regularization because there is going to be missing values and I don't want to overfit to the uh, missing values. And what I'll ask is that maybe errors really shouldn't happen that often. And so I'll ask that the erroneous tensor actually be sparse. So I'm gonna first show some results in thinking about if we synthetically removed data and, and uh, made it missing. So if it is how well we capture, how well we're representing the original matrix uh, tensor, sorry. And so higher fit is better and lower is actually bad. Uh, what you'll notice is that repair stays fairly consistent regardless of the amount of missing that I'm gonna take away. The other ones dip significantly. So it's fairly robust to large amounts of missing data and errors, actually, it turns out. Now then, if I want to think about embedding space again, right, uh, and I'm thinking about in-hospital mortality prediction now, uh, what you'll see is that the extracted patient embedding still offers more predictive power, even though I have a lot of missing data and I have a lot of erroneous data. Uh, and you'll see that the green line is the one that we really care the most about. So just to summarize this first part, right? Uh, you know, if I think about Parafac2, it's really a mechanism for modeling sort of temporal misalignment in data. Uh, you can think about introducing meaningful constraints to help with interpretation and, and downstream prediction performance. Uh, explicit modeling of missingness obviously will improve the quality of your representation. Uh, and what I've hidden under the hood is that all of these we've thought about scalable algorithms so that we can learn them relatively efficiently compared to. It's still much more expensive than matrices, but it's, it's, it's still better, right? Um, and so before I switch gears, are, are, are there any questions on this first part? You guys are comfortable? Yeah? Okay. So I'm, I'm now going to switch topics entirely, right? Uh, and so I'm going to motivate systematic reviews. Uh, and so it turns out that it's actually a critical component of evidence-based medicine. And it's extremely human resource intensive. So it's actually an average of 67 weeks to completion. So I want to think about it in the context of a systematic review. Uh, and what you'll notice is typically because I want to get all the literature back, 
I'll do this really exhaustive database search. And what you notice is that uh, I'm going to retrieve 20,000 different articles. Now, someone, right, luckily not me, uh, has to manually screen it first for titles to determine whether or not it should be included. And then once I throw away about 16,000 of the titles, I'm actually going to go and read the abstract, right, uh, to determine whether or not I even want to read the full paper. And so what you'll notice is that I'm going to select 4,000 abstracts for reading. And then I'm going to go ahead and after reading all these abstracts, throw away most of them and then only read the full text for 78 of them, right? Uh, and in the end, what gets left is 51 articles will be included in the systematic review. And so what I'm going to focus on is uh, sort of the abstract part, right? Uh, trying to figure out, well, how many of them should I actually read the full thing of? And less than 1% of the retrieved articles will actually make it into the full screening process. But just imagine, right, if you're the lucky person that has to sit there and read all 20,000 articles, right, uh, you'd, you'd be crying, right? At least I would be. Um, and it's actually getting worse these days, right? So if you think about, you know, the rate at which publication is happening, right, 20,000 is actually one of the lower ends these days. It's probably closer to 50 or 60. So let's think about how you might automate this, right? So I'm I'm first gonna put on the hat of NLP and convince you that that's not the correct hat to do, right? Uh, so let's imagine that I have this particular abstract now, right? So I have a title, and now my goal is to determine whether or not I want to include it in this abstract, uh, sorry, in the systematic review. Now a human will go ahead and read the abstract, look for specific keywords, probably and then determine whether or not they care about it. Now, from an NLP perspective, right, uh, so if you go back several years, right, you might think about the unigram and bigram. Then we start transition to TF idea, right? And then now with all the, you know, the, the great things with large language models, you can think about contextual embeddings, right? So I'm not even gonna go all the way to, to LLMs these days, but I can think about BERT, Elmo, or Flow. Now, it turns out that if you include some citation information, you might be able to get better. Uh, so what you can see is on the right side is a BERT model that's trained on scientific text, right? Uh, and I'm looking at how well it separates the different articles, right? So whether they belong to medicine, engineering, mathematics, or environmental science, you'll notice that the embedding space is actually not separated very well. But I can think of building something better with citations and potentially getting some slightly better embedding space. So I want to motivate, you know, A, like not thinking about NLP yet, right? But thinking about bibliographic networks. Now, typically when we think of graphs, we think of a homogeneous network, single node type, single edge type, right? So whether or not a paper cites another is my single edge type. But it turns out that actually there is much richer information available, right? You can imagine there's authors, uh, where you publish matters quite a bit, right? Conference or journal venue, uh, and, and all those things you might want to think about. And then, so there's multiple node types. Uh, and then also thinking about, you don't want to classify each node as similar, uh, each edge type as similar, right? So whether or not it's a connection between an author and paper, you'll want to treat differently than let's say a paper and conference. So what's really popular in graphs these days is to think about graph neural networks, right? Naturally, deep learning has taken over everything. Uh, so the intuition of graph neural networks is that I want to map all my nodes to lower dimensional embedding space such that similar nodes in the graph are close together. And the key distinction between text and graphs, right? So uh, if, if you're more familiar with the NLP side and less so with the graph side, is that in graph world, uh, it really should be invariant to permutations, right? So if you think about text, right, uh, whether I flip two words actually matters quite a bit. In the graph world, it doesn't matter as much, right? And so I want this, you know, sort of invariant to permutation. Now, in, in some work that we did recently, uh, what we can show, right, so Spectre is actually a NLP version uh, of based uh, contextual embedding. 
And then everything I'm showing to the right is going to be a graph neural network only, which means that there's a limited amount of text that I'm do thinking about. And if you're curious about, you know, the sort of the statistics, right? So it's in the top right-hand corner uh, in terms of the number of articles that you're going to look at and then the ones that are included. And what I want to show, right, is these two rightmost ones, right? Uh, in fact, using just the bibliographic embedding, right? So the embedding from graphs with very limited text data, I actually do much better than a BERT-based model. I can't guarantee this will hold, right, for GPTs these days, but uh, this was work that was done about a year ago, which is pretty promising. Now, the downside to thinking about modeling these heterogeneous graphs, right, is that there's been this work that shows you actually can't replicate the great results, unsurprisingly. Uh, so what I'm showing you here are several different uh, graph neural networks for heterogeneous graphs, right? Uh, and then GCN and GAT are two homogeneous graph neural networks, right? So, the top set is what is actually reported in the original paper. Uh, and the bottom part is actually what's reproduced if you standardize what you're passing in, right, uh, and how you pre-process the data. So unsurprisingly, actually, A, you know, the, the results aren't as promising as you think they are. But GCN and GAT actually do, you know, the homogeneous versions are actually a little bit better than the heterogeneous versions, which is a little bit sad. So ex existing heterogeneous GNNs actually fail to outperform homogeneous GNNs. And we've been trying to figure out, well, why might that be the case, right? And, and one of the big reasons why is we think that there's a lot of noise in heterogeneous data. And so how can we minimize noise and make it a little bit more robust? So what we developed is SR Comer. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use community detection to improve robustness to graph noise. Uh, we're thinking of, you know, multi-view approach for handling the different edge types. And then we're going to think about fusing information from them. So to do this first, I'm going to introduce my third, I think my third tensor decomposition now, right, which is Tucker decomposition. Uh, so unlike CP, Tucker will decompose into three factor matrices and what is known as a core tensor. Now, it turns out that it's an, a generalization of CP. Uh, and then what I want to highlight is that G is a core tensor. And so I don't ask that all my ranks be the same. Uh, so in other words, A, B, and C need not be the same dimension, right? the low, low dimensional space. So it's a little bit more flexible. But this is a slightly different take, right? So in other words, I, I have this new core tensor in the middle, but I, I'm still decomposing it into three different uh, matrices along each dimension. So we're going to take advantage of this. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce shorthand notation. And you'll notice this is why I say, you know, I'm a bit sloppy with my notation, because it'll look very similar to the CP. So we're going to use Tucker and think about it from the perspective of detecting communities, right? So what you can imagine is if I'm looking at this big bibliographic network, most likely what happens is that there's communities inside there, right? So you might imagine the labs, right? DOE labs are all their own community. Uh, you might imagine that the you know, healthcare folks might also be their own community. And I can use this concept of community to reduce the noise, right? Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and express my heterogeneous graph as a tensor. So as an example, I might think of like a paper authored terms. And then what I'm going to do is I actually want to preserve community information while getting a low rank approximation. So I'm going to go ahead and compute the Tucker decomposition using higher order orthogonal iteration. There's many different algorithms. We chose the one that is most similar to SVD. Uh, and then we can use the super diagonal entries of the core tensor to determine the number of communities. So what you'll see here, right, is, is a very similar interpretation to SVD. You can see right around here, there's, there's less, you know, the, the values go down, and so maybe this is about the right point. And I'm going to use this to determine who belongs to what community. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct a community graph. 
uh, by performing random walks, right? Now, because I still have these different edge types, I want to be able to preserve information for that. And so I'm going to view each edge type as a different view of my community network. And so I'm going to go ahead and sample in the context of community and also edge type. Then once I sample my new graph, I'm going to go ahead and use GCN to learn a better representation. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all these representations together and I'm going to collapse it into the final one. Uh, and so multimodal stack autoencoder, the architecture is shown there on the right. But the idea is that each view will have its own representation and I'm looking for a fused one across all the views. So I'm first going to learn a community view representation all together, and then I'm going to compress them all into the final one. So just to give you an idea of how this might work, uh, we built a graph with four node types, paper, author, uh, terms, and also thinking about publication type. So P, A, M, and, and T are the, the versions of it. We construct four different edge types, and we're going to compare against different baselines. So what I'm showing you is just a quick graph of you know, the differences between the different models. Uh, so the first two are really homogeneous versions. Uh, whether or not you're going to sample a subgraph, um, whether or not you're going to fuse these different views together, and whether or not they're supervised, and then what's the module that's you know building the representation under the hood. So these are the results on the Cohen data set. So statistics are still up in the right. What I want to convince you first, right, is that our model is the best. It's bolded, right? Uh, but in general, heterogeneous network embeddings actually give you better results than the homogeneous version. And what you'll notice is really the gap between sort of, you know, GAN, GANI and the IEGCN, right, is we focus on community detection. So you can sort of see the boost that's provided uh, in terms of that. And I want to, you know, convince you that actually Tucker was the right decomposition to choose. So we ran some ablation studies thinking about, you know, what if we replace the different versions with one another? So the first one I'm showing you is for one of the systematic reviews. This is a localized multi-view uh, model with no community detection. So this is if I just construct random walk without thinking about communities, what this will look like. If I detected it using SVD. So what you'll notice is there is some improvement, right? Uh, I'm, I'm building robustness to the graph. If I think about CP, I, I get a little bit better, right? Because I'm in higher dimensional space, but I'm really restricting things. And so uh, what I can do is a little bit better, which is the last column. And then if I simply replace, you know, the multi, multimodal autoencoder with simple averaging, I'm going to lose some of that information. But Tucker is seemingly the right way to go. And so this model actually allows us to think about Tucker decomposition to identify communities. Um, and then our framework allows us to avoid having to specify the meta path. So in, in some of the other models, you actually specify what is the path between the different edge types that I want to keep. Uh, and fusing information from communities and edge types actually use, yields better representations. So with that, I'm going to move to the last part, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing the temporal part, uh, only because you, know, you guys might be a little bit bored already. So temporal graphs are, you know, one of the things that I'm assuming in the previous version, right, is that graphs are not changing over time. Uh, and, you know, in citation networks, as well as many of the other graphs, actually, I want to think about how to deal with time. So you can imagine there's always going to be new papers, right? As we're speaking, there's more new papers that get published on our path. Uh, new authors are coming up, right? Everybody's in a race to publish. And as things are evolving, there's new terms, right? So large language models used to not exist 10 years ago. They're common, right, LLMs. So we want to think about, well, how can I adapt uh, my embeddings to capture this information? So from the knowledge graph embedding side, uh, there was this decomposition called RESCAL uh, that's looking at how you capture representations 
you know, when you have multiple different relations. So you can just think of it as uh, I have different nodes and they have different edge types between them. So you'll you'll see, you know, the the math looks very similar to Tucker. Um, and in fact, it's a special case of Tucker with uh, one factor matrix. This is one perspective to think about it. Uh, and another way to write it is to think about it, you know, X of K is A, R of K of A. Now, that doesn't really quite capture the temporal side. Uh, and so more recently, there's been a lot of work in image processing and signal processing to think about how you might want to capture temporal correlation. Uh, and so what was introduced was TSVD. Um, and the idea is that I'm going to do a circular convolution between three different tensors, right? And it turns out the middle tensor will have this right uh, sort of diagonal form. Uh, what you can think of is in matrix form, uh, each element is a two. And that's how they, they want to think about this. Uh, and in this sense of thinking about this tube, tube analogy, the form is going to be very similar to SVD, such that U and V are orthogonal tensors. Uh, and you're simply just stacking up these two uh, matrices together. But it actually, you know, one of the really nice properties it turns out is someone showed that the circular convolution is equivalent to computing the multiplication in Fourier space. Uh, and the reason why I say this is nice is Fourier space, right, uh, is very good at capturing temporal correlations, right? So periodic correlations that happen in time, you can really pick up in Fourier space, right? That's sort of the really nice property. And so this is, TSVD has really been thought about in the context of signal processing and image, right? Because, you know, there is this periodic, you know, pattern that I really want to think about compressing, right? And sort of summarizing succinctly. So what we're proposing is TAFI, uh, which is tensor factorization for temporal network embedding. Uh, and it's basically a marriage of RESCAL and PSVD together, right? Um, and the goal is basically because my graph is, you know, I, I care about learning the embedding and it's going to be symmetric. I want just one factor matrix, right? But I also want to capture this temporal dimension. Uh, and that's where I have the circular con convolution. And that means that I will get this really nice representation of a temporal embedding for each node if I look at A. And then what you see is I'm just doing some regularization on A and R to prevent overfitting. Uh, and so obviously, you know, I, best to convince you with quantitative results. So we're looking at five different temporal graphs. Uh, and what I'm showing you are different benchmarks. So I'll explain them a little bit. So these first three are temporal network embedding models using deep learning. Right, so in other words, I'm going to think about neighborhood approaches and, and marry deep learning with you know, neighborhood propagation to learn these models. And you'll see these are roughly how well they do. There really isn't a single winner across the different ones, although HTNE does relatively well. Uh, TNE is a temporal network embedding based on matrix. And so you see there's some loss, right, because I'm not quite capturing the neighborhood, uh, the temporal information as well. And what I'm showing you in the back part are going to be the three different, uh, the four different tensor based. So the minus on ours means no regularization, and then the right side is regularization. So what you'll notice first is, you know, if you look at the first two columns, so TSVD and RESCAL, you'll notice that in general, the tensor based approaches actually can achieve similar or better performance to deep learning. Right, especially for these uh, smaller nodes with more temporal data. And then what you'll notice is that if we appropriately model uh, the temporal using both the marriage of some symmetry and also Fourier, right, uh, we can achieve the best embedding that there is. And so what I hope to have convinced you, right, is that in thinking about you know, Toppy, right, we can develop these tensor-based methods to exploit global network structure, um, and they capture better representation compared to the neighborhood algorithms. Um, 
the circular convolution operator really helps, right? So Fourier, you know, thinking about Fourier transforms actually captures this periodicity that can happen in these bibliographic networks. Uh, and then one of the other benefits is that I actually really don't need to think about regularization necessarily uh, if I wanted to save on com compute space. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and summarize you know, what we discussed today. Uh, what we thought about, right? hopefully what I've carried you through is uh, how you can think about different forms of biomedical data, tabular or graph. Uh, how you might use tensors to learn some better representation uh, to get this embedding space. And what it can do for you is that it can actually capture global structure uh, for better improved representations. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and acknowledge uh, all the hard work is not done by me, but by my students and collaborators. Uh, and so you can see a, a picture of my PhD students on the right who did some of this work, and also a lot of collaborators at various different institutions. Uh, and I want to acknowledge that I'm funded by NSF and NIH, and much of this work is, is due to their support. So with that, I'll conclude and, and take questions. Um, are there any questions either online or in the room? There are no questions in the chat. Okay. All right, well, for those of you online, feel free to, uh, you know, you can come off mute if you have to have a question. Feel free to ever try and tensor factor and make sure perhaps a counter literature of applying this to image processing. So I haven't done it recently. I, I've tried to stay away from imaging only because I, I think, you know, with deep learning, it's, it's really hard to beat uh, with the CNN architectures. Uh, but I thought quite heavily about how you can think about tensors to actually compress the, the architecture and learning parameters. Um, and I haven't yet convinced a student to work on this yet. Um, but there, you know, especially with TSVD, there's been some work to show that it, it's pretty promising and it can approximate deep, deep neural networks. Um, I think what you lose is the non-linearity. So there's been a lot of merging of the two spaces, I'd say. Yeah. But hopefully I convince you to think about this or maybe come work with me and think about this, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Um, have you considered uh, or, uh, Considered the graph Laplacian in uh, any of your community detection algorithms, and I just I don't know of a tensor-based uh, version of that. Have you have you come across anything like that? So we tried the graph Laplacian version of it. Uh, I think so. So I, I should say the Toffee work. So I'm assuming you're referring to most of the Toffee work here, which is the last piece that we've been thinking about. Uh, so my PhD student actually did this at the very end of her PhD uh, journey, and so we didn't actually quite explore a lot. Uh, I don't believe there's a graph Laplacian work yet that I know of, but I suspect people have been thinking about it quite heavily. Um, Even in your community detection piece, right, uh, because graph, we get the cuts, right, and... Uh, I, I assume that you're doing, I not assume, but I think you said that you are doing uh, your community detection based on clustering, right? That's correct. Um, and even in that piece, uh, I guess graph Laplacians could play a role. That That's true, yeah. I, I don't know that we really thought that heavily. So, you know, I, I think in the end, we haven't gotten that much better results with the uh, with tensor as we would have liked. Um, one of the things that I, I sort of hid under the hood is that uh, Tucker decomposition is quite expensive. Even HOI is, is relatively expensive. And so uh, for us to benchmark on the bigger data sets, it's, it's been a little bit harder to think about how you might scale. Um, and so running the, you know, thinking about also graph Laplacian, I, I think is another added hurdle, I'd say. Um, but I, it, it's something that's worthwhile to think about, I'd say, yeah. It's a great suggestion. Thank you for your talk. It's very refreshing to see something simpler than neural networks. <laughs> oh, uh, you know, I, um, yeah, I, I, I won't get started on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's actually a... not as simple as, as you think it is. There, there's a, uh, all the computational math 
folks probably are, are yelling at me internally, but I've, I've hidden all the, all the details of how you solve these uh, under the hood. Yeah. But. Um, I have, a, I have a, a quick question. One of the things that's in, so I, I am more familiar with matrix computations than tensor computations. Um, one of the things that's um, nice about the singular value decomposition when it comes to matrices um, is that it has this, this very nice theoretical result around existence and uniqueness, sort of regardless of the matrix that you're using. And so that allows you to use it kind of with confidence. Um, I'm wondering what the state of sort of existence and uniqueness results are for some of these factorizations with tensors that you talked about today. Last, I mean, my memory is, is sort of eight or 10 years old, at least as of eight or 10 years ago, I think I remember there not being as many theoretical results about it. And it was sort of that it like empirically worked well. And I'm wondering if that's the state or, or, or what. So for three of the ones I covered today, uh, there are actually theorems that support uniqueness uh, and permutation invariance. So CP, uh, Tucker, and Perifect 2 all have uniqueness. Uh, so the version that we've been using all have uniqueness um, proofs that, it, that go along with it. So uh, HOI is one method for uniqueness. HOSPD is one also for Tucker that exists, uh, and it's provable. Uh, for Perifect 2, You'll notice that I, I put this constraint that uh, you, I, I believe you, UT has to be, you know, some uh, some orthogonal that provides uniqueness under only under that uh, representation, uh, and then CP also has the same uh, for the generic class, which is the least squared. Um, the other ones are a little bit more hit or miss. Uh, empirically, if you so if you stay in the Two norm space. All these uniqueness constraints all exist there. Uh, these these nice proofs. Uh, once you go past numeric data and think about like binary and, and count, then you really start to lose a lot of that that representation power. But empirically, you're right. Uh, it generally does turn out to be pretty robust. Um, cool. At, at least better than deep learning, I should say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. Thank you. I have, I have a non-technical question towards the first part of your talk. Can you talk about some of the challenges of obtaining data sets when you're working with things like patient data and how often people were visiting the doctor? How, how do you get data that's quite private? So you make friends, I'd say, uh, is the hard part. Um, I So one of the great things that, that sort of appealed to me at Emory is that we have so Emory is one of the biggest healthcare systems in Georgia. Actually, no, I shouldn't say one of the biggest. It is the biggest uh, healthcare system in Georgia. Uh, and so over a three-year time span, so if I'm looking at like between actually four-year time span, 2014 to 2017, we saw about, I want to say 10 million patients within our healthcare system, unique patients. Um, and so that's an easy way to do it. Uh, the difficulty is obviously getting the data itself and having the architecture. And so we, someone at Emory has been nice enough to do that. Uh, most of the time, what ends up happening is we throw our software over the, over the firewall and people will run it for us um, at, at their institutions as well. Um, and so a lot of what we've been thinking about as well, and, and, and a piece of work that I haven't really covered is thinking about scalability. So a lot of our algorithms under the hood run stochastic gradient descent so that we can run it on simpler com compute architectures. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to have time for one more question, if there's one online or, or in the room. You have a question in the chat. Our, it's, the question is from Akash, is any of the EHR data from Emory open source like MIMIC? Oh, uh, like Mimic. Oh, so yes and no. Uh, so I will say, yes, some of it is available now. Um, if you're really interested, so a collaborator of mine, uh, Judy Cachoya, I, I want to say Judy Cachoya over in radiology, uh, is running a datathon that will be releasing Emory chest x-ray data and radiology data publicly. Um, I think it's at the end of August or something like that. So if you're interested, send me an email. I, I, you know, I know her pretty well. And so there's a few spots open that you can, if you're willing to fly to Atlanta, obviously, um, and, and work on the data, you'll get access to that. Uh, and the data use agreement will look very similar to Mimic because this is all done with also Leo Selly, uh, who, 
helps run Mimic quite heavily as well on the back end. So there is, you know, the long story short is there are some versions of data that are available that is Emory based. Um, there is also ICU data that's available, I think, through PhysioNet, um, which is work that Gary Clifford and Matthew Reyna have also done as well. So if you look at, I, I want to say it was like a challenge done maybe five, four or five years ago. Um, so there, there is versions of data. Uh, it won't look as good as Mimic, and there won't be unstructured data like in Mimic, unfortunately. But I, I think the hope is that maybe in the next five or six years, we'll get there. Supposedly, you know, I, I, I can't guarantee that, yeah. All right, well, let's go ahead and wrap up here. Before we thank Joyce, though, um, she is going to stick around for the next uh, hour or so if anybody would like to um, have a more casual conversation and unpack some of the content that she shared with us today. But let's go ahead and thank Joyce.